Extend. Okay. That's not going to work. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hello, welcome, everybody. So, um, we should probably close the doors and start. It's uh, already 1650, uh, 350, 352. Um, first of all, uh, this is six low, just in case you're in the wrong place. Make sure this is what you want to be. Um, we have a minute taker. Thank you, Dominique. Oh, there you are. And I believe we have a Jabber scribe as well. Thomas, thank you. So, I think we're all set. Um, Make sure you see the note well. Um, this is just to see if you're awake. Actually, you may have noticed this is not the very latest and greatest note well. That doesn't matter. Uh, you have to be aware of the very latest and greatest note well. It was recently updated. Um, I didn't actually manage to do it on time. But it doesn't matter. You have to be aware of the very latest. And uh, you can always get that on the printed agendas and on the ITF uh, 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 web page, etc. So make sure you understand this. Something you don't agree with it, then you should leave. This is our agenda for today. It looks a little packed, but um, I think we should have, at least in theory, uh, a little bit of time left at the end, which is good because we, we have sort of a discussion plan for the very end. So if we have any extra time, I'm sure we'll be able to use it. But basically, we're going to have. Um, an update to six low pen and D, which is actually a collection of about three documents with, uh, uh, with Pascal. And then uh, Yongun will give us an update on the applicability and use cases for six low. We have Charlie on packet expiration, uh, transmission of uh, IPv6 packets over PLC. And then we have a new proposal for body area networks, 15.6 uh, by Sajad. And then at the end, we have Pascal again. And um, with, with the chairs, we're going to moderate a session in total. It will be like 40 minutes. So Pascal will start with some requirements. And then we're going to have more like an open discussion, hopefully with some uh, folks from transport as well. Um, summarizing status since Chicago, we have three new RFCs. 
So DEC ULE now became uh, RC 8105. The low back document now is 8163. And uh, not that it was a working group document officially, but we definitely benefit from it. This is a draft uh, keeping, keeping in on 82.15IE became 8137. And as we had announced in Chicago, we actually went forward and carried through and dropped uh, the mesh link establishment uh, effort that we were undertaking, um, partly or quite um, in large part uh, due to interest through, from Jupiter Mesh and Zigbee NAN. Since they no longer needed it and we didn't get the required update, um, then we dropped it and everybody was fine with that. Uh, status of documents since Chicago, we have, well, backbone router, you'll see an update on that. That's still ongoing. Uh, NFC, we um, uh, will see a, an update by Singapore. So we don't have one right now, but by Singapore, uh, incorporating more comments, etc. cetera. Um, APND is also part of the quote unquote 6775 update, uh, which Pascal will tell us about a little bit more. Um, the other interesting one was Bluetooth LE Mesh. Uh, we could have had an update this time around, but the authors uh, very wisely de decided that it probably made sense to wait for implementation experience. That's always a very good reason to wait for a little bit more. So implementation experience, we should have maybe something by Singapore, hopefully, or and um, the applicability and use case, we'll see an update now. Uh, and uh, of course, 67, 75 update uh, itself, the main document there is, was updated uh, with working group comments. After that, we actually issued a working group last call, which finished about a week ago. And uh, there were no comments during that period, but I understand some people are still, uh, uh, thinking of, of sending comments in. So, um, uh, but it, it looks looks reasonable. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it for status. So, uh, unless anybody has any agenda bashing, we can go forward. Pascal? Let's see. I I'm not going to insert anything here. So I just say next and I'll yeah keep the laser. Okay, so this is Pascal Tuba from Cisco. So I will talk to you about the, uh, the, our suite of drafts, um, which basically stands from the RSC 6775 update and then goes all the way to the background router and uh, the address protection drafts. Next slide, please. So um, we have uh, extracted the RFC 6775 draft from the background router draft. They were uh, both in the same place initially. And so we have extracted what really updates the RFC versus what is the new proxy operation. So basically, the RFC 6775 update can be seen as a layer three association process, whereas the backbone router is like a proxy uh, operation. What does a router do to act as a layer three proxy for neighbor discovery? Next slide, please. So the status of the draft, uh, a refresher was published uh, late June. So there's a number of uh, cleanup activities which took place. There was this big review that uh, Samita published on the mailing list, and we acted on that. Um, we removed the text which explained how you can avoid sending both Ripple DAOs and Dardac, and the, this being uh, this should be made on the basis that this should be a separate document which really says, focuses on savings you can make when you've got both on the same network, but this document is exclusively about ND. So the references to repo are gone. We'll have to write them somewhere else. Um, we might have been too efficient in doing this, because one... <laughs> the nice way of saying, <laughs> okay, well, um, point is, there is one important thing 
which is the, the operation of the sequence counter and how it wraps, how it's initialized, how it's reinitialized, etc. Uh, when you reboot. And all this text was actually a reference to um, the path sequence in RFC 6550. You do the same as this. As we remove the references to 6550, now we don't have any more operation of this sequence counter. So we are missing that text and we have to find to decide how we reinsert it. Either I say reference to 6550 or we copy the text so our uh, RFC is self-contained. But it's, it's a clear goal that it obeys the exact same rules because you need to be able to use one or the other but not having to send two messages in a repo fabric. Um, we, we have added two versions ago the uh, recommendation because tend to use 7400 to expose the capability to do this new draft. Now we can live without it, but it's better, it's clearer to announce that through new bits in, in that draft that, that this capability is supported. Um, there was also a need for the address protection draft to provide an additional status code, uh, which means that the, which basically returns that the proof that was given for the security token uh, is uh, not accepted. And so, so this status is provided here, but the action on the status is in the APND draft. And we, had, we separated the privacy discussion from the security consideration. So we have two now, those two separated. The security consideration is the usual security thing. And all the text which says, oh, by the way, we don't tell you, oh, you build an address, we place no constraint on what you do. But if you do it, please make sure you follow the, the privacy recommendations this is now its own section. Uh, by the way, there is at least uh, one implementation. I've seen two. I don't know if the second one is complete. Um, the, the document was ready for last call. It was actually last call. I thought I had fixed that slide, so I'm confused. But maybe I wrote it on a different slide. Yeah, I finished we, last call a week ago. We finished last call. There were not so many comments. Uh, some of them uh, I received on, uh, directly. So I asked the author to publish them on the mailing list. Uh, it was not done, so please uh, consider that it's not completely complete until those commands are published. Uh, and there we go for, for, for this slide. Next slide, please. Oh, no, it's not the right slides. Oh. Because I checked on the, on the site and they were good. So that's why I was surprised that this slide was incorrect. Uh, we have a separate one for back home router. Yeah. This one. That's everything separate. You get the update, you get the water. Yes, this one is correct. That's the second draft. But I was supposed to be presenting 6550 first. Oh, well, this side is correct. Mm. No, that's the old one. There used to be three, three decks in one. Well, and Samit asked me to, to send them separately. So the old deck with everything in it is. Deprecated. Yeah, I think I, I got your three yes, and new ones. Yes, these are the trees that I need. So this time I'm going to discover that. That is one of the three. This is the second one of the three. And this is the third yeah, one of so, the three. So I agree with the second of the third. There's only one, one slide, and it's correct on the website. There's only one slide in each of the Python router and the hmm. So what do you, I don't know. These are the three you have right here. These are the three you got. Uh, and the extension Python router, these are the new ones. Yes, these are the new ones. Can you, can you open the one? That's the one it's open here. So it doesn't do anything because it's already open. And this one. And this one. Oh. Can you present with this Pascal or um, do you want to swap out? I, I can talk in way. Yeah. No, but swap out Pascal. Like, and uh, take the next person on the agenda while you figure this out. You want to do that? That would be nice. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Resend the slides to Gabe. I can also bring that up here. Why don't you yeah. make sure they're there? Well, I, I, I can keep you. Yeah. 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 Just connect your left. <laughs> Oh, not this one. This one. Do you have a VGA? Yeah. This works for me. This works for me. Okay. There you go. Hey guys. 
what was it? Kill scenes of the reverse side of the car. Okay. Yeah. So we are going to have some surrender. You see? The other PowerPoint and the other PDFs. Okay. Just start as well, it's good. Like, uh, I, I'll run through them, okay. okay. So for the people remote, including Samita, like uh, Pascal is just switching slides. Yeah, no yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay, so this is really the slide yeah. Okay, so just to give a uh, so some a little background about the whole work is we are at the crossroad of wireless and IPv6. And on both sides there were expectations. Uh, requirements that were thrown over the fence on what uh, basically a start group expected from the other. Um, for instance, IPv6 has designed solicited multicast uh, with these requirements that there would be uh, two at the power of 24 multicast groups to make it uh, perfectly efficient. But on the other hand, those groups were never, the capability to, to have this number of multicast group was never present on the IEEE side meaning that it has always uh, re, um, been uh, broadcasted as opposed to multicasted. That, that's never presented and did work, but that, that kind of creates limit to the applicability and of ND to experimentally 10,000, the order of 10,000 nodes, right? Which this limitation really comes from the fact that the multicast is broadcasted. Now, on wireless, it's uh, uh, stringently different. Now, in a general manner, NDA requires a very reliable um, multicast or broadcast operation. Even if it's a broadcast, it needs to be very reliable because that's how we discover address duplication. And as it goes, we, we all know that due to some laws of physics, sadly, the, the wireless will never provide that. Cheap and reliable multicast is not something that radio can provide. So, um, Certainly 4862 uh, cannot operate as designed on radios, which boils down to the fact that if it appears to work, it's mostly because the entropy of IPv6 addresses makes it so that the collision is very rare, not because IPv6 operates as designed. Okay. So this is basically um, the expectation from the ITF on what the IEEE should have or should be doing, but that was never present on the IEEE side. Now, the same effect uh, exist on the other side as well. There are those expectations that the IEEE has on ITF, which were never really there. In particular, in Dot Eleven, you read that uh, Wi-Fi recommends that uh, a proxy operation is performed on the IP for uh, ND and ARP. As it goes, we have never specified this operation. And so we have resorted to uh, proprietary implementations to decide how exactly a proxy would operate in that particular context. And the one thing which, which certainly uh, does not exist and cannot be done without a standard is the equivalent of the association. Because what those implementations do is that they snoop ND and uh, DHCP, eventually they, they resort to traffic if nothing else works. And based on that, they discover that a certain address is present on a certain uh, AP, and that's the way uh, all this proxy operation is kicked off. Um, basically, we now use uh, RFC 6775 update as the layer 3 uh, association process, whereas the backbone router is the proxy and the operation process. So we are finally can bridging the gap between IEEE and IETF and providing the missing link which really enables a proper operation of NDP over radios. Next slide, please. So this I already presented. Next, I think. This I already said. Okay, and this one has the correct dates in it. Um, so like, like I was saying, we, we have addressed, no, we were, we are there. Go back, yeah. 
Um, so now this is what I was trying to say on the previous slide where, which is, this is the pointer to the last uh, long review that we had on this document. And so we had this privacy discussion. We were a bit too um, efficient in removing the, some text about the TID. Uh, we have removed the text that uh, uh, enables the DAO, sorry for the typo, to, to refresh the dark state. Um, and we passed working group last call. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, so like I said, I get some private commands. We'll address them, but I ask the, the author to copy to the list, otherwise I'll forward. Um, like I just said, we probably need to, to point again on 6550 or to copy the text which describe how the sequence counter is initiated, you know, the lollipop thing and all that sort of thing. And do question for the chairs, do we have enough review to call it victory or do we need more uh, work group time? Uh, Gabriel Montenegro, on the how to restore the information that was uh, taken out, I would much rather, I would vote for having a self-contained document because okay. if, um, if you have a pointer there for something that would end up being normative mm -hmm. to Ripple and you, you are implementing something that has nothing to do with Ripple because supposedly this could be a more general facility, you don't want Ripple to be normative. Great. So okay. you want the document to be self-contained. So that, so that would be my... So I will ask the author of that text in Ripple if he can copy, give me the text. Hey, can you give the text? Yes. Okay, that's <laughs> done. I, I, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. Rahul Jado from Huawei. Uh, so uh, the update allows the proxy to register to a six... Uh, proxy-based registration to 6BBR six, six is what I understand, right? So extended ERO, ARO option, allows a proxy-based registration. A, pro a registration to the proxy on behalf of the thing. target. Okay, so now the word proxy appears twice. First is we register, for instance, a, a Wi Fi devices could register to the AP acting as a layer three router uh, for the, to get the proxy and the operation. So that's the first occurrence of the word proxy. There is a second occurrence of the word proxy. I think you're talking about the second mm. one, whereby the root of the Ripple DODAG can proxy the registration to the proxy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on behalf of all the nodes which it learns through Ripple and maintains through Ripple. So that's why it's so important that this TID operation is aligned to the operation in Ripple. Because basically, in normal runtime, you won't see the DARDAC periodically. You will just see the DAO periodically. But the TID inside the DAO that the root receives will allow the root to maintain the pro the state on behalf of the registered target. node. Target node, right? Yes. So that's why actually one of the big changes that we have in this document versus 6775 is that we register the target as opposed to the source because the, the root yeah. of the ripple <coughs> DODAG is the source of the packet. But what's being registered is the target. Actually, it's in my mind, I mean, at least mine, it's kind of quite consistent with the usual use of a target. So I'm pretty happy with that change. So, uh, you know, the next question for me, uh, from me would be, is it even possible from 6BBR to deregister on behalf of the target? To what? To deregister. De like we have the proxy oh. registration now. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, if you get a no path DAO, no, no, I don't think the spec allows you to do how to do that. I'm sorry, but I have some text on that. I just don't remember what I wrote. <laughs> the reason why it gets complicated is because of the TID, addition of the TID. Now it has an associated state information which it has right. to maintain. So, which has a lifetime. But um, we have to think it through whether it would be a good idea that a DAO with a, path, a, a lifetime zero, a no path DAO, mm -hmm. creates a deregistration or not. And and out of my mind right now, I don't remember the arguments. There are some, and they are in the draft. I think I discussed that case, but I don't remember. Can we take that? To yeah, the sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. So, so Pascal, like, do you think that's going to result in changes in the draft, or? I don't know yet. Okay. Can we integrate that as a work group question? Uh, the question? This is part of working with Blesco. So okay, so that so, and the forthcoming comments that okay. you indicated. Yeah. So Raul, let's have this discussion remaining. Let's just clarify. I think there is text on that because I kind of remember writing it. I just don't remember what the arguments was. So I don't remember what the conclusion is. If you disagree with what the text that's in the document, then please raise a mail on the mailing list and we'll sort it out. 
Okay. Um, Pascal, um, this is Samita. Pascal. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so I was um, referring to Pascal's question on whether we should extend the working group last call. Um, may I suggest that maybe uh, we could, after he publishes the next revision, maybe we could have a short uh, extension for one week for people to review. Does that make sense? Maybe Gabe and Suresh, what do you think? Would, would that be, Samita, a clarifying question? Would that be, you know, dependent on the amount of changes that are yeah. uh, put there, right? Yeah. Um, because I was asking right. the, to get, uh, my question was not spelled correctly. My question was, do we think we have enough review during this work group last call to call it victory? It was not about the, the commands resolution. That's how I understood it. And um, I mean, I'm OK with waiting a little bit more, because we know there are comments forthcoming. It would be a shame to not allow them to come in. I mean, it's just a few more. So yeah, let's just wait for those comments to come in. Okay. And then and then we'll deal with whatever happens, just like okay, any sure. other working of less call. If there are too many changes, we'll do another working of less call. Sounds good. You probably have the two other slides where well, right next to it. Um, this is so you're going to the backbone router, okay? This one. That, okay, yeah. Go for it. So, like I said, the the RC sixty seven seventy two update extends the operation of the update from a DAD operation to a registration operation for services such as proxy and D. Uh, in the future, we may decide to use it to, to register other things, but at, the, at this moment, it's proxy and D. The backbone router is the proxy and D operation to which the uh, update uh, enables the registration to. Next slide. Okay, so actually I just published a, a refresh because the document was reaching uh, timeout. We have, a, we have an implementation. The, it has been demonstrated several times uh, at the ATF, including at the 60 uh, plug test with, with a, a client by Toma, by the way. Um, certainly we could use more implementation. Certainly I would love to see more interop. In particular, I would love to see a open source backbone router implementation uh, to test the interoperation between two backbone routers on the backbone. Because what really happens is when you've got a uh, mobile device, Wi-Fi or, or uh, 6 lopen that moves from one 6BBR to another 6BBR. So it moves from Ripple DAG to Ripple DAG, which, and, and they are different 6LBR. Now the two 6LBRs, need to agree on where the device is. And that's part of the spec does, right? Enabling movement. Um, I have not tested that with another implementation, certainly because I only have mine. So I would love to see another implementation and, and play with it. But that's where we are. Um, I also asked IEEE, in particular, dot 11 experts to review those two specs. So this is happening. Um, We'll see what pops up on the mailing list. My goal being, you know, this was kind of reviewed for the 15.4 world. I would like to have an assessment of the dot 11 world. Just to, so if, if they see, you know, if you change those three bytes, this, or, or all these two words, this would be applicable to Wi-Fi, so it's not like that. That would be bad. So, 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 so I, I've asked that. But otherwise, for I'm concerned, I mean, seems that this is well, well, ready for well, Google Plus call, been very stable. Any reaction there? Sure. Nobody pops up, yes, I'm doing an open source implementation. No, 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 OK. <laughs> yes, you were. I know. I know, I really hoped. Almost, almost is almost as good enough. <laughs> OK, well, we are done for that one, I guess. And then there is the uh, address protection. This one here. Okay. And they said, I see you're in the room, so please jump in if there's anything you want to add to what I'm saying. Um, so certainly, this is the third piece of our story. This is how we perform source address validation, which is savvy. 
uh, because we have this state in the 6LBR, we can validate, uh, including a crypto state, we can validate that the user of an address is the one which registered it in the first place. We can validate that when an address moves, um, the, the, the new place, well, the new device which claims the, the address at the new place is the same as the old device, and we can validate that with some cryptographic uh, exchange, proof of ownership, basically, of a token which was given in the first registration. That's pretty much what it is. Uh, so we kind of revamped it quite a bit, to be honest. It's, it's editorial, but we have removed a lot of uh, extraneous text in appendix. Um, so there is a lot less um, normative text, which normally would help later in the process. We have added this section about updating our C6775. And we claim that we are review, uh, ready for a review by at least a, a first review by security directorate for which the chairs uh, basically called and asked Tero Kvinen, who has been helping us a lot in many security activities and who is an expert of 15.4 uh, 15 security. Yeah, well, summer was not the best time, but we expect that uh, early after summer we'll, de we'll get uh, the feedback from Tero. That's basically where we are. Again, any question? No. Uh, I think we have to get moving. What? We have to get moving because yeah. we actually no. took a lot of time. Um, so. Okay. Maybe. So next on the agenda, the uh, Yongun with the um, applicability and use case. Hopefully I have the right slides this time. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Yongun Hong. Uh, so I present the six row applicability and use cases. Okay, this is the history. Uh, you know, uh, we discussed uh, from this issue from ITF 89 meeting three years ago. So we present the first uh, individual draft and ITF 94 meeting, and we uh, uh, the working group adoption was done in the last year. So this is the second revision. So I would like to focus on the uh, goal of this uh, document. Uh, this document, the goal is to help six row, six row pen stack adaptation by layer two constraint technology and help a newcomer understand how six row pen stack can be applicable in practice. So useful new ad adapter of I OT at ITF. So uh, in this revision, we try to include some practical six row technology. So that is the JuPyte Mesh and the Wison. So the update based on the last IT meeting, so we got uh, several comments. So the uh, goal is to make this document more short -hand and clean and focus on applicability. So we uh, specify uh, six row link uh, link technology in the cell. So we uh, 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 make the LTMTC is uh, the example of the potential six row L2 candidate. As, uh, and as I said that we include, well, next, yeah, we uh, include two uh, practical six row deployment scenario. That is Wi-Star and Jupyter Mesh. And we add a new new section of guideline for six row six row pen adaptation, and we move to uh, we move six row use case example to appendix because we are focusing on the applicability. So the uh, some uh, text for uh, use case is moved to appendix. So we add some additional editor command, and the Samira uh, help us many. So uh, she is Edith, so one of the author of this draft. 
So in this document, we have the seven sectoral link rate technology, that is G-Wave, BLE, and that really, and MSTP, NFC, and PLC, and uh, I3A15.echo. So in this uh, uh, link rate technology, the PLC is uh, under the individual director. So I hope so. Uh, this uh, technology and and the uh, draft for regarding this uh, technology should be some of the working group document in this working group. And we unmark uh, the LTMTC as the potential candidate because uh, we survey and we solicit uh, we solicit the uh, practical use of the sixth row, but unfortunately for regarding LTMTC, there are no. Uh, uh, practical uh, six-row uh, deployment scenario. So that's the reason we uh, mark as the potential candidate. Yeah, uh, this is the comparison across the six-row ring clear technology. So there are seven uh, technology and we uh, want to uh, compare the, their uses and their technology and subnet and mobility requirement and security requirement and buffering requirement, uh, latency queues requirement, data rate, and there are some related RFC or draft. So as you can see, there are some uh, com uh, common point and there are some the different the point. So if you look at this table, uh, you can uh, um, analyze or you can uh, evaluate some uh, the incorrect technology for your target services. So that's the reason we uh, made this uh, comparison table. Yeah, uh, and we add the new section that is the guideline for adopting IPv6 tech. So it target candidate for new constraint L2 technology that consider running modified six row, six row fence tech. So uh, we must consider that uh, item, that is address model, MTU consideration, HRS3 routing, address assignment, header compression, security and encryption, and additional processing. So until now, we have the seven link layer technology, but in future, maybe new link, uh, six row link layer technology could be made. So in this case, we should consider their technology for these items. Yeah, so we add uh, some the practical six row deployment scenario that is Wison. So this text uh, was uh, uh, helped by the Paul Duffy. Uh, he is the working in the Wison Alliance. So you can uh, see the Wison technology is based on this technology. And among them, Wison peer Area network FAN technology it covers some of the related network technology. So uh, we found that uh, why some uses of six row stack is that is the advanced metering infrastructure AMI and distribution automation DA. So it is some interesting uh, point that six row technology is really used in the real world. And another six row deployment scenario is JuPyter Mesh. So JuPyter Mesh specification is based on this uh, technology and the JuPyter Mesh in smart grid is using the six row network layer. So this text uh, was provided by Michael Bellitis and Dash Chubier. And so thanks to their support for this document. Okay, could you next please? So, uh, and we uh, had some of the design space dimension for six row use cases. Uh, for example, deployment, deployment, bootstrapping, topology, L3 or L2 and something blah, blah. So originally we describe and we uh, write some of the specific uh, design space dimension for each uh, six row technology, but there are a lot of context so we delete many parts and we would like to focus on the design space in here. And 
uh, six row use case. As I said, that in the main part, only one uh, use case of BLE, that is the smartphone based interaction with the constraint devices, and the other use cases, for example, G Wave, Back to BLE, and MSTP, and Next page, please. Yeah, NFC, PLC, IEEE 8, ODA 15.echo, that uh, use case is uh, moved to appendix. So we make uh, this draft more shortened and more clear to how to understand what's the goal of this draft. So that's all. So thanks. Carrie Lynn, <clears throat> first of all, thanks for uh, pulling all this together. I think it's a very useful survey uh, of the field. Um, I guess my question to you is, one of those things on the list is not like the others, which is MSTP, which is wired and everything else is wireless. Um, have you thought about doing some sort of, I don't know, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's some sort of a, uh, a figure of merit that might be based on, you know, good put, per you know times distance times price or something like that i mean how would how would somebody uh you know choose a wired data link over wireless based on reading you know your your document oh uh, yes the good question so uh, actually uh, we don't consider the uh, differences between wire and wireless so except mstp other technologies are based on the wireless right you can see so There's PLC too, right? Sorry, PLC. Ah, uh, uh, also PLC. So PLC is the, the, the not uh, the working group document. Yes. Uh, so MSTP and PLC is the wire, and other technology is wireless. So okay. So, uh, so currently we don't have text that uh, reflect your uh, question and command. So um, I'm thinking, and I try to how to. Or reflect. So you can help us. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pascal Tuber, I'm just reacting to what Kerry said, and uh, there is some feedback from the real world in, in the metering uh, business where um, they will tell you that for large scale metering, there is not one uh, link layer solution that fits all situations. For instance, if you have building, if you get line of sight, if you don't have line of sight, if you are concrete, etc. And uh, the, the return for implementation and, and deployment that I got is that having a layer three routing technique, which allows you to actually use multiple sorts of link, and maybe you deploy both and you see what works, mm -hmm. uh, is a lot better than uh, deploying only one and send uh, a technician back later because it does not. Mm -hmm. right. So, so that's really where the power of routing and using repo in this kind of use cases is so visible because you will actually use both wires and wireless. Okay, thank you. So, any other question, comment? So, you can see this document includes some of the various link layer technology. So, so I'm not expert of that area. So, uh, we need some other expert to review and give some the practical information of the six row uh, link layer technology uses in the real world. So. I'm also asking, and the Kerry says that uh, he gave us, and the other person, I'm waiting your input of this document. Okay. Yeah, so, thank you. Uh, Charlie? Okay, well, hello, I'm, I'm Charlie Perkins, and do I just say when it's time to change slides? Or yeah. Okay, yeah, I guess it's time. Um, so just a quick overview. Uh, we've been uh, working on this uh, draft to specify uh, the delivery deadline times for um, um, packets in a six low pan network. And currently we have um, a packet delivery deadline time, and then also you can put in the time at which the uh, um, packet was first sent. And with this information, you can uh, uh, make decisions about 
whether to drop the packet because it's not going to make the deadline. And you can also uh, make determinations about how long it's been in transit. So it's a, a pretty, pretty simple idea. And um, uh, it also assumes basically that you have a time synchronized network so that you can have a consistent idea of what time it is. So that's, um, that's sort of an underlying assumption. And uh, given that you have different networks uh, that are still basically synchronized in time, uh, even if they have different ideas of what the current time is, uh, you can still do uh, transmission between those networks. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, after the last IETF, uh, there was discussion about uh, including uh, ASN as a time unit. And so that seemed like the right thing to do. And uh, so we put that in. Uh, there was also some, dis some discussion about how to handle the reserve field. Uh, we didn't do anything about that except just to say that it's reserved. Um, but other than that, the draft has not been uh, changed very much. But one sort of uh, pervasive change was to, um, uh, the draft currently is, uh, the name of the draft is expiration time, but I think deadline is much more accurate description of what uh, is provided. So in the text of the draft, it uh, basically usually says deadline or delivery deadline or something uh, along those lines, but the name of the draft has not been changed. So, I mean, except to say it's dash 04. Um, so next slide, please. Here's a, a quick look at the uh, uh, format for the, uh, for the extension. And um, it's, um, see, well, basically there's a O means that the origination time is present. Uh, D says how you can handle uh, dropping the packet if it's, um, for instance, you, you may allow for this um, uh, information to be transmitted even if the deadline is passed, if the uh, D flag is uh, set to be zero. Uh, question? Yes, Pascal Subert. Uh, Charlie, there seems to be, I'm, I'm still very supportive of this work, right? Be very clear. Um, there seems to be this, this assumption that you know how fast it takes to get there and that the routers in the middle uh, know if this packet is late or not late or, or, or do you just want to, to drop the packet when it's too late but having no clue at all if, if you can make it? Because it seems to me that basically you should drop the packet as soon as you know you cannot make it, not, to, not go all the way till deadline. Yes. But that seems to imply that you know how long it takes to make it. and, and my command is pretty much the same I did last time is, for instance, if the route schedules the transmission all the way using non-storing non mode all the way, it would probably be able to compute also the various hops deadlines. And so use that recursively or use that along all the hops so that each hop would know how much time it has to forward this packet just to respect the schedule. And if you end up doing that, then you have a source routing version, started version of TSN, basically. Well, you kind of do that with TTL, right? I mean, if you want to say that this packet can't survive more than five hops, and I'm not talking about hops. I'm saying, oh, if I if this root schedules this path with this source routing information, uh -huh. and it knows the packet must make it by that time, it can also say, oh, first hop it should make it by that time, second hop by that time, all express in ASN. So, so you, you're really able to 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 give the network uh, what is your reference forwarding expectation. You know, I can somehow imagine a network where you'd like to have that close control of granularity of planning, but I don't know how to do it. And uh, I think that this is going to probably get a huge majority of the applications. And, you know, as you say, uh, let's say that you have an intermediate point where you're one uh, microsecond away from the deadline. Well, you might want to drop it anyway. Um, but uh, um, this is simple enough and useful enough that I, I hesitate to uh, volunteer for additional complication. Okay. Um, so you can go out there and uh, get the implementation that's been merged in with the OpenWSN. Um, it was presented also uh, at the Six Tish by Elijah, and we view them as a uh, a natural customer for our, for this sort of um, uh, feature, and uh, the implementation has a EDF for earliest deadline first uh, policy, which I think is one of the uh, most basic kind of 
deadline policies you might want to use. Uh, question? Uh, Carrie Lynn, yes. um, I'm just wondering uh, if you've got any information on whether the dominant delay is queuing delay or transmission delay, or does this vary by technology? I'm thinking back to Pascal's question or, or, or response. Um, it seems to me that in a mesh network, for example, it'd be very difficult to predict that all of the hops are have the same cost, for example, because it seems right. like as you get closer and to the edge, those those nodes are doing more routing on behalf of other nodes below them, so that potentially there's more traffic going through those nodes. Yeah, I think you know those. You know, if you want to take a look at uh, sort of measuring the distribution of delay times through the router and then slice it up between uh, queuing delay time and uh, other effects, well, that's a pretty good paper. Um, and as far as I know, uh, there, depending on which network, different effects are dominant. I mean, some it's it's if your network is congested, boom, you're that's it. And I'm not sure whether you want to count uh, uh, delay because of uh, interference versus queuing delay on the router. Those are two different kind of things. So uh, I'm going to sort of maintain my my blissful ignorance here and just say, well, you just want to say what the deadline is. And, and let it go let go at that. Um, go ahead. Uh, Thomas, what I, Kerry, I, I want to answer. I think it depends on the technology. Uh, from the OpenWSN uh, stuff that we did, in six-dish networks, uh, the delay time is mostly queuing. You wait for your slot. Yeah, that's my point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I actually had a second question, and that is, uh, how closely do the clocks have to be synchronized? Do you, <laughs> is it is it just within some epsilon? In other words, can they can they sort of you know oscillate within some you know some epsilon? Well, what, what if I told you that we measured uh, experimentally that the clocks have to be within um, um, one percent of the deadline time? That would be a total lie. Uh, but you could you could make any sort. I mean, you can decide. You could get into the question of how hard is the deadline, and that would go back to this D bit that we talked about, whether you're allowed to you know pass it along or not. And this is a valid point of discussion. Um, but on the other hand, maybe it's a better idea to just put it out there and see what's really needed. You know. Maybe we can just catch up for like two minutes tonight if you're going to the social. I want to tell you about a project that, you know. Oh, sounds years ago. great. And okay. I'll be at the social if you okay. want to chat. So, uh, Charlie. Uh, hi, Samita. Uh, hi, hi, Charlie. Uh, quick question on the time synchronization. Uh, so, I understand that it works on 6 dish. Um, so, but uh, do you have any recommendation of a time synchronization? Um, protocol or how uh, time synchronized, what time synchronization mechanism should be used um, for this draft? No, no, we don't have any additional uh, implementation. Let me see, now I shouldn't say that because, you know, I didn't actually do this uh, implementation. Uh, it was done by Elijah and folks. So, uh, presumably, I mean, if they're running on a normal platform, you can have a time synchronization protocol running. But I, I don't have any additional information about the specifics of that. I think it would be good to have some sort of um, either boundaries that I think Kerry was mentioning or some sort of information of time synchronization because it seems like this is a dependency for this uh, for your draft um, so some recommendation on time synchronization or reference would be good okay that's a good point how about if I compose a message to the mailing list and we have discussion and we can uh, insert a description about that I'm looking at you sideways so. <laughs> thanks uh, uh, do we have another minute yeah. so Thomas um, Time synchronization, I, I can answer exactly for this implementation. Uh, in this implementation, it's in the order of across the network around 100 microseconds. In commercial, in commercial, it's around 10, 15 microseconds across a 100 node network. But 
But this doesn't have anything to do with this draft, right? Not this really. draft just says timestamp in, timestamp out. And whether you're well synchronized or not well synchronized, not it doesn't affect at all this draft. This draft just timestamps. So I right. think I think, you know, how the network is synchronized doesn't really matter. It's to the application to say, okay, I just received a packet which has this timestamp. What do I make out of it? I know what's running in my network. I know how much I can trust it. But this draft will carry it regardless, right? It's independent. Right. So what I understand is, just to make a dumb example, let's say you send out a deadline uh, thing here and say, I want to have a deadline of uh, one microsecond from now. And you're, you're not going to really get very far. So we could insert some language in the draft that says, well, you know, uh, the precision of your deadline time uh, has to be affected by the precision of your time synchronization. But that won't change the format of the packet. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, but, uh, you know, if the time synchronization precision uh, is not very accurate, uh, then time out minus ti time in minus time out may not be very correct. So if you specify some, you know, range of time synchronization precision, that would be good enough, I, I believe. But I think we can probably discuss on the mailing list. Well, if I, I know if, if you see something on the mailing list, please comment. All right. Sure. Uh, Gabriel. So I had a question. Um, trying to understand the semantics of this thing. So looking at the D bit, uh, you turn it on, then you're supposed to throw away the packet if it's beyond the the deadline. Correct. But the operative word there was should. So do applications know if they have to rely on this, if they can maybe rely on it? Is it meant to be just to get rid of extraneous traffic uh, on a best effort basis? I mean, what kind of semantics are applications expecting? Or are there going to be are there going to be issues if there are duplicates, for example, because somebody did not obey that should, as they're you know open to do if it's a should. Would, it's not would a must. you uh, recommend that we change should to must? I, no, I'm asking because I don't know how it's used, so I don't know what applications expect. It was a question about that. If applications expect very clear, crisp semantics, then I guess a must is is probably a better choice. But I, I don't know what the applications do with these things. Okay. Um, it's meant to just get rid of extraneous traffic. That shit is fine. Okay. Um, I don't know how to answer that. But, I mean, we could ask six tish folks. They might know. So, Thomas, I'm not answering six tish I'm just answering thinking out loud about applications. If you send a packet with one of these headers in there and you set the debict for drop after deadline, I mean, you expect it to drop, right? So you should, you, we should make it a, a must instead of a should. Well, if it's a should, then I set the bit, and what happens? So either I set, I don't set it, and it just carries on, or I set it, and it must be dropped. So I would say that to must, otherwise I don't see. I'm but, okay with must. Okay, next slide. So uh, they implemented. We would uh, like uh, to request working group adoption adoption of this draft. I think uh, it uh, obviously has a purpose. Pascal, do you have a question? I'm back a little bit. Uh, th this is a, I always forget the name, but this, this is a header that you can ignore, right? Um, so so how, how comes you can expect a must operation in something you can ignore? I'm sorry. I've, could, if you don't ignore it, then you must. You know, like you must <laughs> well, but maybe. Not, you shouldn't, but you must. <laughs> How conditionally mandatory. Yeah, Sarash so, Krishnan. So uh, I I don't really see how that can be a must, like or a serious must, right? It, because it's optional to process, right? So if you put it in, you cannot expect it to be enforced. So this is like hop by hop options in in V6, right? You can say you can say like if you don't understand this, drop the packet, right? But like there's another RFC or RFC to be which says that oh if you don't want to process hop by hop options, don't do them, right? So like you're in a very very similar boat, like because you can say must if you want, right? That's okay with me. But it, the sender still cannot expect, if you set the D bit, that the packet will actually get dropped because somebody won't understand this like deadline option, right? Uh, so, okay, uh, can you say a little bit more about why someone not would not understand 
deadline option. So let's say somebody doesn't implement this draft on the path. Does not implement it. No. Okay. Not at all. Right. All right. So and you said the debit. Do you expect it to be dropped or not? Right. Like I would say no. Can you rely on the fact that this will be dropped? Right. It's, you cannot. Right. You cannot. So like you can put the must in or a should in, but the thinking needs to be like you cannot depend on this happening. This is still best effort because you don't know who's on the path who can actually recognize this, right? Because what you're saying is like, like I think Kerry said it best, right? If you understand this, like you must drop it. That's that's different from expecting it to be dropped. I think that was Gabe's question, right? Like how do you expect it to be honored, right? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, you, you, Pascal again, you know, Charlie, in, in Framulay, there was this discard eligible bit. If for those who were born that day, there was, there was a D bit in the DLCI. And what that would say is if you have to, you have those five packets in front of you and you've got time to transmit three. Well, if two of them have the D bit, then the choice is clear. You transmit these three others. So, so basically, this looks like a D bit with a time bomb on it. That's really what it is. I mean, before that time, treat it as a normal packet. After that time, if you really need to discard something, then discard this one preferably. That, that's a behavior that, that can be enforced by those who, but the behavior that you cannot get is, let me make an application that is, per, by design, is certain that this packet will not be delivered behind that, beyond that time. But you're, you're, unless you've got this thing implemented throughout, then this application will be broken. Okay, so this is, you know, you're discussing the end to end behavior, and part of the value of this is in the intermediate nodes. And if they, no, it is. Right, so if they have to, for instance, do some preemption or anything like that, uh, they might preferentially. That's what send the a bit is all that, about in Framework A, right? Right. Pre discard this one preferably. Because the application knows that it will lose a lot of value, or it has a lot less value than this other packet. So if, if you had those two, this one has the bit, this one does not, discard the discard eligible bit. Right. Or well, same thing. After that time, this one becomes preferably, you know, you, you inform red that it should not be so random after all. Right. I, I, I think, Charlie, the point that, like, you know, I was making, at least I think like most of us are making, is that the must doesn't give you much more than the should. That, that's it. Like everything else, what you said is right. You know, there have been entire hours spent on must versus should, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and and one argument is that people don't care about should, and I, I don't believe that argument. But anyway, please. Peter van der Stok, if I want a uh, deadlines be done. Peter, closer to the mic. Peter van der Stok. Okay, sorry. If I make a network on which I want real time to be executed, I make sure that this uh, draft is there in all the uh, in all the nodes. Yes, and then I expect a must. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So uh, can I can I say that we should uh, re discuss this in the mailing list, and then we'll just do whatever people uh, believe. Okay. So. So as JavaScript. Somebody just pointing out that we're 20 minutes late. Oh, okay. So, okay. so uh, please uh, let, adopt our draft. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure I'm, we're ready yet to go, to go for a call for adoptions, but let's definitely continue the discussions about how applications work with us, that sort of thing, a little bit more, and maybe go for a call for adoption after that, depending on how the interactions go. Great. Okay. At this point, it seems a little bit like we need to discuss it a bit more. Um, thank you. Oops, wrong one. So next is PLC Networks. Okay, hello. Uh, this is Jian Chang Ho. And today my topic is transmission of IPv6 packets over PLC networks. So uh, this work was done by me together with Yonggeng and Xiao Jun. And uh, currently it's uh, version one. And uh, today we would like to call for adoption. Okay, next page. So what is PLC? PLC refers to power line communication. This technology uses the electric power lines for indoor and outdoor communications. And PLC has been um, widely applied to support advanced metering infrastructure. So the figure below is a simple example showing that uh, the smart meters transmit data to a concentrator directly through the electric power lines. Okay, next page. Uh, so, I presented this draft uh, last time in Chicago and uh, have received comments from Samita, Stefano, and Sari. And uh, based on their comments, I updated this draft. 
uh, including the, and uh, the following past tasks uh, have been um, updated, including the addressing modes, the unicast address mapping, the neighbor discovery, command frame header, and connectivity and topology. Okay, next page. So comments after IETF 98. So here I would like to thank Samita and Gabriel for building the connection with ITUT Studio. Uh, so and finally we and finally we got the, the support from Stefano and the Sari. Uh, they are two PLC experts from ITUT and they have reviewed our drafts and the following are their comments. So here I will not go deeper into these comments, but I would like to mention that uh, Stefano is the chair of SG15 Q15, which is a PLC uh, um, which is a PLC study group in ITUT, and uh, he suggested that they send the informal feedback at first then exchange license to make it official. Okay, next page. So um, following are the updates of this route. First is a first is the addressing modes. There are two kinds of addresses in PLC uh, devices. Um, the first is the 64-bit, um, uh, the globally uh, unique long address, and uh, the other is the 16-bit short address. So in a PLC network, each device joins the network by using the long address and then communicates with other devices by using the short address. Okay, next page. And for regarding the unicast address mapping, we use the 16-bit short address mode only. And for 1.01.2, since there is one line referring to um, the RFC 4.9.4.4, so we put the 16 panel format for the short address here. And uh, for the ITUT G.903, uh, we put the pen ID in front of the short address. Okay, next page. Uh, and in this version, we um, updated a new um, subsection, namely the label discovery. Uh, for the IEEE 1.01.2, there are two kinds of um, routing protocols. One is Ripple for layer three, and the other is Node NG for, for, the, um, for layer two. So if the um, Ripple is used, then the label discovery process shall refers to the signal pen ND. And if a um, DHCP V6 is used to assign addresses, then the duplicate address detection should not be required. And if and if the 101.2 uses the coexistence mode with 903, then the, the load ng protocol is used, then the address registration defined in the 609 ND should not be used because there is already a defined uh, PAM bootstrapping protocol. But uh, uh, those mechanisms in 609 ND for managing the IPv6 prefix and corresponding header compression context information can be used. And again, in the uh, TUT9903, since the load ng protocol is used, and uh, there is a predefined uh, pen bootstrapping protocol, so we don't use the address registration defined in 610 pen ND. Uh, what's mentioned here is that uh, the 903 supports the 610 pen context option, so we specify that uh, those mechanisms for managing the IPv6 prefix and corresponding header compression um, context information um, must be used. And uh, moreover, for sending the ISRA, the PLC devices must follow the corresponding sections of the 610 ND. Okay, next page. Uh, for regarding the command frame header, this header was defined in 903, mainly for the uh, PAM bootstrapping protocol and uh, for the load engine protocol. We, uh, so in our draft, we specified order in the header format. It should be put in the last position if more than one header is present, and it should be put before the 610 pan IPHC header. Uh, and uh, um, based on some has comment, we updated our example in our draft. We put the command frame header in between the fragmentation header and uh, the IPHC header. We use an ESC. We um, use an ESC dispatch type to indicate there is another uh, dispatch type uh, follows, and this one byte is used for the command frame header to store the command ID and then um, follows the command payload. Okay, next page. Uh, about connectivity and topology. Uh, um, still, we have star, chain, and mesh, but uh, in this version, we um, clarify that uh, uh, they are um, logical connectivity, not physical links, because there are some confusion that if we consider the, the um, physical connectivity, the PLC devices are connected in a trunk link, but uh, if we consider the transmission distance, then they are connected um, logically into star, tree, or mesh topology. And we did some name change in this section so that it can be consistent with 903, which had the CO previously for coordinator to pan coordinator and uh, the node to pan device. Okay, next page. Uh, and uh, last time I put a, I put a question that uh, if, we, uh, if, it, if it is possible to include more PLC standards, and now the answer is yes. So currently we have 1901.2 and 9903, and uh, then 
more purity standards like uh, um, 9904 prime and 1901 can be considered. And uh, well, the 9902 g.hnen um, has been ruled out because currently there is no deployments. And uh, about our next step, we would like to call for the working group adoption so that we can have a further discussion with ITUT and IEEE officially. And again, uh, your comments and feedback are always welcome. Thank you. Pascal Tiber, thanks a lot for this work. I mean, we had an early draft by Daniel Popa long, long ago, and that activity stopped, and that was a shame. So it's very good that you're taking this over, and I thank you for this. Uh, I'm curious. I, I Initially, the, the first work I was aware of was for IEEE 1901.2, yes. which is the classical stack that we care for, you know, IEEE, IETF, usual stuff. Now, I thought that the ITUT was designing its own stack, and, and what kills me, what, what bothers me, what I don't understand is if we do anything normative, which we feel is normative at the IETF for the stack over ITUT uh, G9903, is it, like, is it a norm to be, the standard to be used by ITU people? Who, who would want this specification, knowing that the ITU does its own? I mean, is it a competition to the, the piece that you're defining for the ITU? A network? Is it a competition to the stack that they built? I mean, how do you position your work versus their work? Did they ask you or did they say, oh, we, I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to put the ITF in a weird position where we are defending a stack over something in replacement that they already have, right? Because they already have six lap and over LG1903, that's why we gave them the escape byte, etc. So, so why should we be doing here for, for that? I mean, a competition? Uh, well, here I would like to put, because uh, currently there are many PLC devices, and uh, for regarding the another um, band PLC, you will also have, uh, let's say, the 101.2, the GC PLC, the Prime, and the uh, 101.1. So uh, currently for the vendors, it's, it's very difficult to find a really good PLC standards for their use. So I would like to combine them together in a single draft. And um, if there is something in common, we can put it together, and uh, let's... Well, but imagine, you, you say, uh, you must use uh, NDRAs to advertise this, right, in your document. But then the ATUT already defines a stack and they say how they do things. And now there is a collision there or something, right? Uh, how do we resolve that? And are we, are we mandated for doing this work? I mean, is it something that, that the, the ITU, the chair of the ITUT 9903 has asked you to do, thinks it's nice that the ATF does this? I'm just concerned that we may have uh, an issue trying to define something for them. That's all. Uh, it's just a question. We don't have the answer. Okay, so um, so they did not ask me to do anything, but uh, when I send this draft to them uh, um, and ask them for the review, and if you're very happy that uh, they can uh, find someone who are still promoting their standard, and uh, actually they are still um, maintaining their um, the 903 and Prime, but uh, currently their focus is on the on layer 1 and layer 2. And so now they have a, um, some guy to um, focus on the, the adaptation layer, it would be better. Yeah, but to, to be clear, no, it was not them that asked us anything at all. Uh, I was more, uh, this was brought here, and we were wondering whether there's other people in the world doing PLC, what do they think about this? Just like we asked of NFC, just like we asked of any other link layer. We want to make sure Bluetooth, et cetera. We want to make sure that we're not run, you know, conflicting with them. So we want to make sure there was no conflict we got them involved. The IT2 looked at this. They're actually offered comments, um, but you know we might want to clarify a bit further how they see it because they, the comments have been fine, saying, "Hey, okay, this is this, uh, none of them has said, oh, please don't do it or will ignore it.' There's just been helpful, constructive comments. But um, your point is about clarifying what what is the function of this versus whatever else they may right. be doing there. I mean, because maybe that, they would, they, point. you yeah. know, I can read a document from somewhere else, which is kind of informational and describing what we do. Uh, on the other hand, if somebody wants to normatize something we are doing here, I would not be so happy. So it's just, do they understand that we are doing a standard track document which with a norm of how things should work on their network? Or do they think that we are just describing what they do? You know, as an informational, that that's a very different beast. So just yes, one sure we we clarify this, make sure there is no letter yeah, co yeah, sure. collision. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, and we we definitely will do that. Um, you did also mention something about liaison. Liaison has a very specific meaning in in the ITF, and um, 
that might have come from them. They wanted an official liaison. There's some liaisons already from certain groups in ITUT. I don't think we want to go there for this because the way that it's, it's going so far seems to be okay. Um, the best way to collaborate is actually not through establishing all these big liaisons. That's for, that's for other types of, of interactions. But the best way is actually for the people do what you're doing, exchanging information, comments, going back and forth. And so I think we should push forward with that. Uh, and hopefully we don't have to do a, a formal liaison, which would have to involve IAB into, because IAB handles liaison. So that, that's another process altogether. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I actually, I agree with uh, Gabriel uh, on the uh, on the collaboration part uh, with um, ITUT. Um, so Pascal, we 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 actually got positive comments from um, the PLC as the working group FG15 chairs. Uh, so. So yeah, we, we are uh, in, with collaboration. And I think um, if there is anything new that are different from what they're working on over there, um, so that piece then should be communicated and agreed upon. Otherwise, I think uh, it is as, um, you know, as, this is similar to any other documents we have, like with PTLE or NFC. I mean, sum it up, Pascal, again. This is really where my confusion is. You know, if, if, if this is an informational document saying what they do, then it's, it's a separate document, just informational. If it's something that specifies new operation in a normative fashion. Yeah, there is something then, new. Right. And, and if we do that, then we need to make sure that they expect us to do something normative, not just like, for instance, in LP1, we have, we have informational document about other technologies, but just descriptive. Um, okay, so, point taken. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, Pascal, I don't understand your point. Like, um, if are they doing like L two stuff or L three stuff? Like, are you questioning if they are doing L three stuff or not? They have. Okay. 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 If you can say that at the mic, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. My starting point is they came to us some time ago and asked for this escape field, meaning that they have defined the way they operate. So if we have, a, if we, if this is a document which describe what they do, uh, it's a different path. It's not a standard track. Should not merge with the standard track piece for uh, 91.2. It would be a separate document which would just be informational. Now, if we want to standardize IP operation of our network, knowing that they've already done some of that, I don't know to which extent, but they have done it. Uh, then we may be in competition. So they, if they are very clear that we are doing standard track documents here, I'm happy, you know. If they think we are just doing information on describing what they do, and all of a sudden they describe that, no, no, we are prescribing operation which are competitive with the what they did, then I'm sure they will be a lot less happy. But I mean, maybe it's all done, I'm just, I was just asking. Well, here in this draft, there is some content that refers to the annex part of 101.2, but I also made something um, um, based on my own. And uh, hopefully, I will uh, contact the, the actual sign and make sure that uh, they have no conflicts. Okay. So just in the interest of time, I think we should uh, continue um, on the mailing list. Definitely, I want to understand a bit better your, your concern. But I think we will resolve that offline, not, not in the in, the next minutes or hours or whatever. Um, so I think we can definitely move to um, uh, after we resolve these, uh, this point. Uh, if it's resolved favorably, we could uh, think about a call for call for adoption in the, in the working okay. group. Um, but we'd like to clarify that point first. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. So now we have uh, body area networks, Sajad. Hello, <coughs> good afternoon. Uh, oh, sorry. It's the first slide, sorry. So you can see this is the first draft, which is which belongs to wireless body area sensor networks, and we are looking. It with respect to IPv6, how we can 
make it the part of IOTs. Uh, so the current status is this is informational draft we just uploaded in the June, and uh, we're looking for we, are, we will think about the standard track efforts and suggestion and feedback are requested. Yes, next slide. So there are there are different motivations. I will just describe the few ones like. Uh, uh, one is like uh, the population is increasing day by day. So this is the one of the survey like 761 millions in 2025 people. They need health care. They need remote health care. Uh, another motivation is uh, regarding GDP, like GDP on health care expenses are increasing. Uh, so on a report, you can see the different countries. They have different GDPs, but the alarming situation is like it's getting uh, very high. Especially with like with the USA, it is uh, surveyed like it it will approach up to 20% of GDP in 2022. So these are different indicators uh, like uh, uh, which we are looking which 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 are motivating uh, for this document. Uh, the next slide. I will just introduce uh, the wireless body area sensor network uh, uh, with respect to I IEEE 802.15.6 standard, which is active standard. Uh, uh, no, and uh, it is standardized in uh, 2012. It is, as all of you know, it is it based on Mac and file layer. Uh, the main uh, the main thing is like it incorporates the better penetration uh, through the human tissue without creating any damage to the human tissue, uh, and it it follows the approved uh, mix band, which is medical implant communication service band by USA. So it's uh, it's following the specific absorption rate uh, guidelines which is uh, useful for human tissues. Next slides. So here you can see the different applications, different use cases for wireless body area sensor networks. Uh, a patient uh, can be equipped with different sensors. Uh, uh, this standard is specific with the implantable sensors, like uh, when you implanted the sensors inside the body. And there are different use cases. Uh, uh, you can use it for patient care. You can use it for elder care center. You can use for the fitness and fitness for the sports. Uh, yes, the next slide. The scope, like uh, it defines the scope. Uh, it is basically a short and low power standard, like uh, range is mentioned from two to five meters. And uh, it wants to work on very low power. Uh, it is using uh, ISM bands, and there are different bands. Very low ba low frequencies band are mentioned. I will show you in the next slide. Uh, yeah, it complies. Yeah, uh, com uh, complies with strict uh, non-interference guidelines. Uh, it is taking different guidelines uh, with respect to medical applications as well. Yes, next slide. So why why would you need to standardize uh, this sort of application with the ITF? Like uh, there are a lot of proprietary solutions which are available which are doing this this stuff. Uh, so we just want to make it the part of standard so, so it can be used by everybody. So there there should be a standard like uh, uh, which uh, there should be a standard body. So current solution uh, like current solution are optimized for different type of applications. Uh, beside medical like Bluetooth is optimized for wise links. Uh, Zigbee is optimized for the sensor, uh, industrial sensor applications. Wi-Fi is optimized for data networks. So these are the uh, general uh, general focus points which they are doing. Uh, is the next slide? Yeah, these this is the just a comparison slide built between different uh, existing standards and uh, uh, 802.15.6. You can see uh, it want to work on very low power, like one milliwatt or less than one milliwatt. Uh, and also goes. It also you can also get the uh, high throughput. Like you can use ultra wide band in this standard. Uh, but still, they are following the uh, human uh, tissues guidelines. So you can see it is low power. And uh, in data rate, you can uh, achieve different data rate. The purpose of the high data rate, it like uh, there is diversity of the different medical sensors. Like if you are using ECG, so it's contained different uh, different sort of cable. So you need high throughput. So that's why it's, it, the throughput, uh, the data rates, it varies in this standard. Uh, the next slide. Please. These are the different frequency bands. It's mentioned. Uh, you can see the human body communication there uh, for is different frequency band. Um, it has different. It, it has three types of file layer, like uh, uh, narrow band, uh, ultra ultra wide band, and human uh, body communication. This this is the spe specialty of this standard. 
makes yeah it's it's uh, channel access mechanism it's it's a little bit different like uh, although it's uh, it work on the same pattern like 15.4 is working on the super frame like channel is divided in the super frame but uh, for the medical application they have mentioned like uh, different phases like eap uh, like emergency access phase you can see the different eap in a single uh, in a single super frame then uh, the random access period and you can also see the content access uh, uh, contention access phase like cap which is also available in 15.4 uh, so you, it's little bit different from 15.4 uh, yes next slide please so you can uh, there are uh, obvious obviously benefit for if we use it uh, with ipv6 like uh, we have the addressing uh, flexibilities uh, like uh, and we have auto configuration uh, 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 solutions available uh, simple like uh, if uh, if you are connected with ipv6 uh, so it means uh, you are part of internet like you are part of you can be a part of iot's as well so that's why we are looking for ipv6 there uh, uh, next slide please so there, there are different issues like but uh, especially we are mentioned like the packet size like frame size it's in the standard frame uh, the frame size is 256 which is uh, different from 15.4 which like it's 127 uh, 127 bytes so uh, this is a few few issues we need to look if we want to make it a uh, standard track like uh, how how uh, we will deal like uh, are we going to adopt six low six low pan or we are going to uh, look to the compression mechanisms how ipv6 deal with it so yes the next slide yeah th yeah there are different Uh, uh, industrial you can see different industries which are adopting and making the chips for 15 uh, 15.6 uh, texas instrument national instrument and log devices so the work uh, started so hmm? i'm in line oh you are okay. uh, the next yes because so this is a the brief introduction for the document as it's our first document so it's still informational we are looking for uh so sir krishnan uh, no i had uh, i i read the draft and there's really nothing in there about transmission of six, uh, ipv6 frames right usually when you do ipv6 or full it's like a set of things you specify you know the unique address mapping multi cast address mapping this one only has informational text about uh body area networks and nothing else so is that the intent of the draft or like what were you intending to no, do no like because uh, just uh, because it's just uploaded in the june and uh, Uh, is, uh, we just want to clarify the need, like that's why we mentioned the word wireless body relations and network as a focus point. But you are right, like uh, we should also mention about the IPv6 uh, sort of things, how it can be incorporated. Like we have discussed uh, in the group, but uh, we didn't mention in the draft. Okay, no, but all it says is like, oh, six low pan does not work on this, right? It says the frame format is different. Six low pan does not work, right? And that's it. It so because like. the the title is kind of misleading it says like transmission of da 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 or something has to specify all this right and mm -hmm. that's that's why uh, if you're talking about the need for using uh, doing six low pan for this then it's different than saying it's transmission over right so like our like uh, our focus is on uh, like to use for this standard for the medical application so that's and, okay that's yeah okay. and this, in the second step yes you're right uh, we need to look uh, in detail how we will manage it with IPv6 and those sort of thing, and we are working on it. But we thought, like after meeting, we will add, we will update the draft to comment. Just to from a chair point of view, there's nothing in here for the working group to do. So this would not ever become a working group document because there's nothing for us to do. So it was a good informational presentation, but yeah, for the timing, it's informational document. But yeah. we will uh, look. for the response and the feedback if we get so we'll think about this well, yeah so for next time think if there's something for us to do then yeah we should work you know think about that but if there isn't then that's fine that pascal that pretty much echoes what my questions were i mean do, do do you expect what do you want to build on that i mean do you want to build a mesh do you want to uh, i see that there is need for reliability uh, would you like us to 
put six dish on that five as opposed to the classical 15 four would that would that fit the kind of application that you have in mind we need to know the applications i mean i, I really can figure out a mesh of that on my body i i, I think the idea is quite cool um but i don't know what i would put on it <laughs> oh that's not a question yeah six, six dish can be a good option like <laughs> exactly uh, what the, well if, if you were to describe this and 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 mostly you know I want to do a mesh, six dish mesh on it. So here is what's missing from six dish to, to get this mesh on my body. Then we could act on it, right? That's pretty that, like the, the, I will again mention like the purpose of this initial document is to highlight the uh, importance of this standard, like which mm -hmm. is which is not the part of this. So uh, like we highlight the standard, and now we are looking for the solutions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Alex, so, and then uh, we close that mic on this one. Okay, yeah, thank you. So this is Alexandre Petrescu. I work at CEA in France. I looked at the draft, uh, a very nice draft. Well, thank you, you're the first. I see a uh, frame format section. There are about uh, 300 bytes in this frame. Is this the maximum transmission unit? It's 256, the, yeah. 256? Yeah. So the MTU on wireless band is 256? Yes. I think this is a good starting point. Yeah, that's why I mentioned in the last slide that like the issue like we have we need to think about this. Okay. We need a feedback so we can give space to this standard which is important for healthcare application and healthcare system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we get to the final part of the meeting, which is going to be on fragments. Pascal? OK, so this is, uh, this is a, a discussion that we spent a bit of time last uh, IETF. Um, I exposed a number of uh, drawbacks of the current fragmentation as disclosed in RFC 4944, which are mostly problems in the route of our world. And unless we get clear signals from the mesh under world, maybe the mesh under is perfectly happy with 4944. But th that creates a number of situations in route over that could be uh, improved. So I won't redo the slides I did last time. I left them in the slide where in appendix. So if you if you download the slides from the from the website, you'll find that after the, the apparent end of it, you, you'll have all the slides of last of last time. But I will basically um, use your knowledge of what you said last time to to basically look at what the problems are and what we need to to solve. Right? Please next slide. So then again, um, presented that last time. And yes, there is there is another aspect which needs to account for is that uh, for the LP1 work, we have also started working on fragmentation and we have been thinking of a number of uh, solution space things which could more or less apply to, to the work here. So um, like windowing and individual retry of fragments. So obviously the use case is quite different. The solution will be different, but we may take inspiration from the work that's been done there. Uh, a bit of concept for fragmentation. So initially, the first uh, very very long ago, first six low uh, networks, there was some TCP, and the reason why there was some TCP is just because of this problem with fragmentation. So people would rely on TCP because they would get MSS, uh, max segment size. Now, the drawback of TCP, obviously, mostly if you send very small chunks of data, is you have to pay the price of an acknowledgement back every time, and that's really too costly. So uh, the on the industry moved to UDP, co-op, etc which gives the application the capability to request an ACK really when they want it. And usually they provide, the ACK is not, uh, is an app level ACK with some semantics which come back, not just, hey, I got you, but I got you, so here is what you should do with it. So we are in a space where the acknowledgement is also uh, mostly loaded with application space information. And on the side of your brain, remember that we talked a lot of streamlining last time, explaining that the packet could actually uh, be re reassembled at the other end much faster if we can streamline fragments as opposed to recompose at every hop. And actually, this gives us time where that we can use for retries. Just a, a rule of thumb is the application is not changed if we can live within the time that we gain by streamlining. 
for doing our outreach tries. Okay, next slide, please. So the, the summary of the problem that we discussed last time, prime one, unless we do something which is not documented in any standard, uh, we need to recompose the packet at every hop because we need to build the IP pass packet so as to route it and then pass it to the next stop. So we need to fragment, pass to the next stop, recompose, fragment, pass to the next stop, recompose. And that's what creates this, this very huge latency and buffer bloat in the intermediate nodes. So um, we, we basically want to be able to forward uh, all the way. There is no control at all, nothing which tells you how to pace your fragments, how to slow down, how many fragments can stay in the air. So implementations tend to push on the fragments as fast as they can. And there is all sort of interference and buffer bloat which can be created inside your network again. Um, not only that, but if you have multiple flows which cross on the same router, then it will have to, to store buffers for all those fragments at the same time. And we end up with the classical congestion loss that we see in switch fabrics. But you know, with the number of buffers that we have there, um, that gives us uh, loss very rapidly, and losing a fragment has the side effect that we know that the endpoint will be uh, waiting forever to get the, the fragment it's waiting for. Which is my last point. If you have some loss, uh, then the recovery side, the assembly side, will have to time out. And actually, that's experiencing this, which led um, this RFC 7388 about which which now helps us debug network. That's because they did this as an MP thing that they found that the problem they had was fragment loss. Question, David. I'm moving to the next slide. I suspect I'm about to reveal that I know next to nothing about six low. What exactly? Name, please, David. Sorry, David Black, um, TSVWG working chair, trying to understand what's going on here. So. What exactly are you trying to do with that first bullet? Okay, so I mean that's when I'm skipping what I said at the previous meeting. I'm very sorry for this. But you've got this mesh of six low pan devices and you're doing ripple rot rotting over it. And now you're and the, the, the six low pan or uh, the classical um well uh, uh, 822.15.4 network, the the phi. Uh, we'll have 128 bytes of MTU, which means that if you want to provide the expected service of 1280 for IPv6, uh, you will have to fragments to fragment anything which is in the order of 100 bytes and above. Right, Sorry? L2. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Somebody re re repeating what's in the audience, audience. L2 fragment. That's that, that's it's really important. So, so what's happening is is the transmitter has done an L2 fragment, and now it says at every L3 hop. So what it's do you want to do with the router? It's not, okay, it's not an L2 <laughs> fragment, it's a shim. Um, so, so you've got this IP, you've got IP which sees 1280. Then you've got six low pan, which cuts it into a number of six low pan fragments, mm -hmm. right? And this thing will do multi-hop over the, the ripple network. Now, uh, if you, we, as long as you're at L, as long as you're L two, nothing's gone wrong because I go I, I go hop by hop over over L two. I hit the next. I hit I hit the far end of the link according to according to IP. And at that point, I need which I need is to pack the next it back. hop because we are that's what we call route over, right? Every radio hop is a router. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, do, do I need more or is it okay? Do no, that's what I'm afraid you're doing. Okay. What um what what, what let, let me let you finish your presentation, but oh boy. Right. <laughs> and so, just, just to so, clarify, so you, there's route over and there's mesh under. When this was written, it was for mesh under in which you recompose at the very far end. For route over, there's all these problems. For you route over, you, you put the packet at every hop all the way to IP layer, and you need the full packet there to route it to the next hop. Yeah, the, right. And the problem, the reason I said, oh boy, is for what uh, Gabriel just described as route as route over. You're you're effectively asking a router to route and forward an L3 packet, an IP packet that it hasn't actually received. It's got the header and it's, and. Exactly, that, that's what we're after. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so like I said, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, custom, custom on broken record mode. Um, Broken record mode. What has what what's written yes, there yes, in your, the so what's first? Your, hello, what's written there in the first bullet has been possible for about ten years now. 
which is what uh, you're afraid of, David. It's been possible, it's not been described, and people... It has been described. I, I've Next. read your book, and it was missing the... Well, we can discuss that offline, but you don't indicate yeah. that you need to swap labels. No, there is a difference between an implementation technique and a normative document that defines a protocol. There is an implementation technique that avoids point one. Yes. Okay, now of course we still have to work with those other points. Mm. So for instance, we, we have to think about what does it actually mean for the first fragment to be sent, the next router actually forwarding that first fragment, and at exactly the same time, the original sender sending the second fragment. Yeah, so there but is I disagree with your first point that we have done everything, that there is nothing to do for the first, right? I can dis do you want to, to keep that, my answer to, for later? The point is, I agree that it's lo mostly a local behavior that doesn't need a standard, it needs to be done well, <clears throat> but it's about keep creating a state for the next yes. fragments. And, and so what, is, what, what requires a protocol is, when do you know that you can clean that state? Yes. Right, and, so the, and the, this boils down to, um, if, 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 well, to the, to the last point about fragment recovery, if you, if you have a fragment recovery, then you can use that piece to clean the state, and that's when there is a relation. That's my answer to you. Okay, so the, the, there is a number of, of implementation issues about timing here. Uh, yes, and a number it of probably them. would be a good thing um, to, to think about those. Uh -huh. And uh, if, if I hear what you just said, uh, you want to conflate them with retransmission. I want to conflate, uh, well, no, not really. The two points in the middle are really look close to one another. What is conflated is the recovery and uh, the solution to the recomposition, because you can use the, the, the message back, which enable recovery, to also signal, I'm done. I got yes. them all. You can clean the states in the middle. Well, that, that's one, the only conflation I have in mind. One important observation is that this message back already has been there for a long time. So we, we, have, we do radio layer X of all of our packets, in, of all of our adaptation layer packets, except for multicasts, um, including fragments. So th what, no, that I has don't. already been there. So you are asking for a different kind of additional retransmission. It's the, uh, okay, six loop and wide, end to end. It's not the one hop thing. Right. It's a multi-hop thing. It needs to be very, very clear. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. True. That's that's why it's a it's a lot of a problem, right? Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to say the next thing when you're at the slide that. And <laughs> yes, exactly. And that that would that would be next slide exactly. So let let's keep that for next slide. Uh, Spencer Dawkins, uh, just as an OC individual, um, just to help me understand because I haven't read any more of this draft than David has. Um, are we talking about many, I mean like most packets being fragmented or is this a relatively small number? There are, there are four use cases in the IoT mostly. Two of them, in, in once in each direction, requires fragmentation. One is reflashing of devices, quite rare, and so that's going down to the devices. And the other one is, uh, there are some examples of IoT devices which will capture a lot of data in one bulk, like vibration store that in a file, and then you need to stream that file all the way up, and you want to do that with some blocks. Uh, most of the normal IoT activity will never, never fragment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and, and the last question, just to help me keep up. Uh, so, if you do have a loss, are you, today, if you do have a loss, are you retransmitting the whole packet or just a fragment? The whole packet. You know, it will be okay, transport yeah. layer so, transmission. So what I, what and, I would expect. And, yes. Okay, cool. And, and it's not even that. It's to, to this cost of energy associated to that and a lot of latency because those timers, those retry timers are infinitely long because this network is so slow and it can vary, be very variable as well. So the timeout values are very huge. But but the other drawback is, is mostly what touches us at the sixth open layer is the devices are usually constrained. Right, mm -hmm. mostly. Sure, for instance, yeah. if, you, if you're sending a new image to to this IoT device, and you're losing just one fragment, the timeout is actually very long. 
Mm -hmm. and, and usually all the buffers are clogged with things like that, and now you can't receive anything. And that's really what, what created this RFC 6388 because he was wondering, Jorgen was very wondering why he had so poor performance on his six lopad network. And the reason was once there was there's a packet being fragmented, the loss ratio being, being what it is, he, he would consume all his buffers and they would drop the other packets, you see. And so, so the, and he could debug that because he introduced SNMP in that, in that device, and that's, that's this yeah. RFC. Cool, thank you. Ouch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, we just could see it coming, that, but we saw it coming. One thing, of course, there is a retransmission per fragment, which is the, based on the radio layer egg. On the one hop. Yes. All right. So we cover one hop, we don't cover the mesh. I hope I wrote it in the first slide, otherwise. I hope it's very clear on the document. Now, if you progress a little bit on the network and you don't have a NAC back, or I don't know what, um, then if the packet gets lost in the middle of the network, you're, you're screwed. If, if it's after a few retry, you can still progress, you're not screwed. Rahul Jadav from Huawei. Uh, so I, I think it's an important problem to solve. The problem statement is important, but I have some reservations towards the solution. We're not here for the solution, but I would take them on the mailing list. So, so, so one, one, one of the primary disadvantage uh, Kasten already highlighted about the sender and receiver both for, uh, forwarding at the same time. So while the first fragment has been sent from the receiver towards the next hop, so it increases the collision rate. You mean the, the, the acknowledgments back or the no, second no, no, fragment? No. So a sender is sending a first fragment, yes. then receiver receives it and then sends it forward. But by the time the, uh, the sender oh, has the another Oh, the sender is the relay, right? Yeah. That's what yeah, you mean the receiver. Yeah. This, so this yes. was not the problem currently. It's, it's one of these. It's, it's actually fragment flow is interfered with, uh, with one another. Yeah, yeah. So, so six, six station won't have any problem like that because the second half we use a Oh, yeah, yeah. So for six station, it won't be a problem. So that's yeah. why it's specified single frequency mesh, which is usually wi fi yeah. So the another uh, other problem that I see is with regards to single buffer strategy. If 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 any of the device in the net in in the in the path has a single buffer, okay. Or or let's say the sender has a single buffer, yeah. then unless as until the complete all the fragments are being received by the end receiver, it has to wait. Yes. Uh, um, and that I, will take substantially long time as compared the to the solution is not mandating anything about buffer, the buffers, right? I mean, so it's not prime against solution, it's a prime, prime, right? Uh, I don't know, I'm just saying just, that, you know, there's a scenario where the center has only a single buffer, uh, let's yes, say it's a constraint uh, node. Oh yeah, that's, that's really what goes prime in our system. Right, yeah. so, so, uh, so let's say it has 10 fragments to forward. Mm -hmm. And now, in the current case, it forwards all the fra uh, 10 fragments in a single, in a single stage. Oh, without any one. wait. Yes, it pushes. There is a, yeah. There is there. Yeah. There, there will be layer two acknowledgements. There will be all. So, but the point is now it has to forward it five hops down the line. Oh, it will take and more it, time if you slow them down at the source. Yes. And okay. you you won't be so the source has to now keep more a bigger queue for all the other packets which are buffering over the time. True. That's true, right? Yeah. So I just want to. Good. Take into consideration this. Just, time. just a uh, higher order bit here. Uh, I'm going to cut the line right now. Uh, so after Thomas, because we need some time at the end. We want to actually ask some questions. This is not about designing a solution. This is not about a solution. This is just about here's some statement. potential issues, and then the questions will be more like, should we do something about it? You know, that sort of thing, right? So we want to get to get a sense of the room of what whether we should do something about this problem. I'll be very quick, Thomas. Um, I think this is an important issue that we need to. Uh, address. It's a major, major pain to have to reassemble at every hop. It's all kinds of problems with buffers, how long do I wait, stuff like this. Um, and I've read your draft right before the meeting. I've sent a kind of a very detailed PDF with many, many, many points. If Carton says it has been done, great, but I'd like to understand how. Uh, either we can have a side meeting. I mean, we need to do something about this. I, I think we, we, we agree it's important. Uh, it's, this has been coming up so many times. I'm waiting for something I can use. Uh, and 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 so either we we come together this week and we figure it out or I don't know we do an interim but I I, I mean this cannot be coming up again in Singapore and again after that we just have to solve this thing it's not hard. Can we move to the next slide and then we'll have a lot of time for question and response. So I based on the primes that were listed on the previous side I basically 
made that list. Don't know if it's complete, but it's what my view of it. First thing, we need to provide fragment forwarding. So um, whether it's all a secret source in a, in a node or we actually explain, we, there, are, there are pitfalls. I described them last time. There are ways of doing this very wrong, which appear to work until they don't. Uh, so, so those pit pitfalls are known, some of them at least. We, 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 I documented them in the slides. Addresser propose a way that everybody understands, that everybody validates, that does the fragment forwarding well. Okay, even if people have been doing that for 10 years in their own implementation, I'd like the ATF to come up and say, here is a way that we recognize work and we'll, we'll do the trick for you. And, and yes, my draft says you can do it with MPLS switching of the label, of the data contact. Uh, pointing, point is, if you fragment the first packet with, if, if you forward the first packet with the IP address, then you need to leave a state for the next fragment that you need to, to clean later. Um, second thing, we may or may not want to solve the second problem in the previous list, which was kind of this, this burst of fragments going on. If we send this burst, like uh, Raul just said, we free memory on the sender, but we bloat the next hop and then the next up, which may get different bursts coming from different places. At the end of the day, packet loss, fragment loss, all the bad things. Uh, do we want to do some pacing windowing to avoid loading the network beyond its capacity to uh, avoid congestion loss? Same thing for, um, well, next step, sorry, fragment reliability. Do we want to be able to retry individually fragments which have been lost somewhere in the middle of this mesh? So exhausted retries in the middle of the mesh, what do we do? Um, and last but not least, uh, ECN. Do we want to be able to throttle more or less efficiently based on the current state of the network? Do we want to provide some form of explicit congestion notification? So my, my solution draft obviously has them all, uh, but clearly also people might think it's a huge overkill. So, so that's, that's where the discussion lies, and then is maybe other solutions in mind. But at least my draft says all this can be done. There is a way to do it. Next slide. So I just said the first line. This is a fast forward. Like Thomas said, we've, we've been there for so much time. I mean, this problem has been there. I it hurts. Can, this is part of the questions that we can ask. Okay, Maria, okay, so. okay. So I'm done. Okay. In the appendix, you'll find my slides for last time with some drawings and stuff, David, if you want to go through them. Um, oh, Samita, want to drive? Okay, um, I can go through some part of the slides and let's see how we can handle the questions. Uh, so thank you, Pascal, for uh, elaborating the issues with the route over. So when RFC 4944 was defined, I think it's called 8 to 2.15.14, um, 8 to 15.4, it was mainly designed for mesh under um, forwarding. Uh, and um, this is mostly at the 2.5 layer um, packet forwarding with the six slope and adaptation layer and using mesh. Um, mesh header uh, and uh, the problems that uh, if, if you if you want to use the same technique for route over um, you will have the problems that Pascal already mentioned so the next uh, few slides we are going to Gabriel and I are going to put together some of the questions um, and see what should be in scope and what shouldn't be in scope. Um, so we know that uh, we have solved mesh under, but um, we want to ask the working group uh, if uh, the current definition uh, for fragmentation, forwarding fra fragmentation format um, under mesh under um, is sufficient for other uh, six low technologies. If there is any interest in the working group to revisit and uh, reevaluate that. 
partly I know that some of the other uh, technologies that we have specified in this group, um, many of them don't want to use fragmentation because they are because of their MPU size or that's what they have um, specified. And um, if there is any implementation uh, in layer two that they may want to use mesh under with fragmentation, that is something then we can work on. And the second question is route over. Um, it looks like um, you know Pascal has been uh, uh, promoting these the fragmentation solution for some time, and today in the working group we want to, I think, take a consensus whether it, we are going to work on this route over um, fragmentation solution, knowing that the current um, uh, specification is not sufficient. Um, so, Gabriel, do you want to take the yeah. Yeah. question just now? We, we have uh, five minutes left, so I think we should get on the, get onto on the, the question. So, okay. uh, Carson, do you have a clarification question or something very quick? So I want yeah, to go just into... want to make sure that we actually discuss things that exist. So, uh, no, actually, the solution in 49 and 44 works for road over. So, uh, okay, so let me ask the questions then. For, um, first, we'll ask a question about mesh under. How many people here think that 4944 and the collection of you know associated documents, basically the six-low model, is fine for mesh under work for other than 15.4, or maybe even for 15.4? Basically, do we need to do something extra for, in particular, for mesh under? Is anybody interested in that? Things that it's missing. Okay, so I see no, nobody raising their their hand. Um, for route over. Uh, how many people in the audience think that uh, the working group should do something, or the ITF, whatever, maybe it ends up somewhere else, that um, the ITF should do something about uh, improving fragmentation issues for route over? Raise your hand, please. Okay. Let me count a second. I'll tell you what, Uh, yeah, it's 20 plus. So it's about probably more than half. Okay, so that's something like definite. What's yes. the number? 20? Uh, it, was, it was more than 20, 21, 22 ish. Um, it definitely looks like more than half of the people okay. in, in, in here right now. Um, yeah, we will. Yeah, All, both of these questions we will report what we saw here, but we will confirm on the list. So if you didn't get a chance to raise our, your hand here, you can do that on the list. Um, we uh, do, 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 do. well, the big question with the three seconds that we have right now is: um, <laughs> it seems reasonable to think that there's going to be potentially some work on route over. Carson disagrees with that. No, I'm not disagreeing with it. I'm, we need to properly describe what we are doing. Yeah, that would be part of what we would do. I think, and then and then I you know actually do it. So the, what do you mean by that? You mean uh, um, there are three parts that are muddled together here. One is describe what people have been doing for a decade. That's probably a good thing to just write it up. Um, that may be a good thing, but Two? I think what, this exercise is not about an informational document. No, so but, but one that is, that's a great thing to do that goes to, to go into an article. Requirement to, to get out of this muddled, muddled thinking. The second one is, do we have recommendations for implementations to uh, do good timing in the presence of, of these optimizations? Probably also informational, because it just describes good practice how, how to do things. But it could also be normative. I don't know. And the third one is, do we want to add a completely new thing, which is the, the fragment retransmission mechanism that goes over multiple hops within the 6 pan? That's a completely new thing, and, and one where we 
maybe getting some transport pushed back before we have described exactly what, what we want to do. Yeah, I also saw other, other new things like ECN. So there's different yes. potential new things that, um, and I guess that's the last question, a, a design team should go off and figure out. And then for each one of those new things say, yeah, we think we should do it and here's how. I'm, I don't think, I mean, it would be great to have some background info, but the main output of this effort, I think here, from the point of view of, of, of working group is, if there's something to be done, what is it? What's the normative text that we're gonna, we're gonna add into the collection of CISLO documents? You know, and history is great, and we can use it, and maybe we can even reuse it as is. That would be great. We just need to solve the problem or problems. Um, so I think a lot of the questions you're asking are right, but I, that might be um, better for the design team to go after each one of those. And that's something we can, we have to continue, definitely. We have to continue. So um, a final question I want to ask is how many people here would be interested in forming a design team? To work on this specifically. Let's see, let's see. The other thing I have is the people who are raising their <laughs> the people are raising their hands. Please send email to the chairs so that we have the, the composition of that design team. And that way we can say we can finish on time. <laughs> so the the one thing that I would like that design team to do first is collect the research that we have available to actually that, do anything. That would be a good input to the design team, but yes. there may be other opinions. But definitely, I think we have to close at this moment. We're officially uh, at w one minute over, and there's a social, and people have to go grab it. So at this point, um, we will confirm these things in the mailing list, but uh, you're, uh, we're, we're done. Uh, do I have both? Blue sheets right here. Is there another blue sheet in the room somewhere? Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Thank you.